All right, you hooligans. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. It's a dark winter night in Cordova here. Uh, definitely a pretty familiar audience. Uh, so a lot of this stuff... Um, Many of you in the room might have more first-hand information than I do. There's definitely a lot of you with a long history of uh, herring research and probably some some herring fishermen in here. Um, my name is Stormy Hot. I'm the area research biologist here in Cordova for uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Division of Commercial Fisheries. Uh, I'm going to talk about herring tonight, which is pretty exciting. Uh, a lot of our work out of the office, for obvious reasons, is salmon. So anytime I get to work on herring, it's... Uh, kind of a, a nice treat here. Uh, as we go through, if you have questions or comments or notice, uh, recognize anybody in any of these historical photos, please uh, <laughs> shout out, in interested to hear it. Um, there's a little bit of a delay between the clicker here. So I'm a research biologist, not a management biologist, but I do want to start off with a little bit of a public service announcement here. We did have a regulatory change for subsistence herring fisheries at the 2017 Board of Fish. This was last winter. Um, a permit is now required for subsistence uh, harvest of herring. Uh, you get it through our office, it's free. There's a couple new stipulations. Um, before this, if you, you know you didn't need a permit and the gear was somewhat unlimited, uh, there's a couple new things with this new permit. There's now a 10 fathom max gill net length for subsistence fishing for herring and principally in sound. Um, you need to up here report your harvest within 15 days of any harvest you have. Call Jeremy or call the front desk, call Lisa, and then at the end of the year, just like your salmon subsistence permit. Uh, the whole thing is due return to the office uh, by January 15th. So just wanted to start getting it out there. Last year was the first year it was required. We did not do a very good job getting the word out that this was a permit. Uh, so I want to kind of start this early. Tell your friends if they go out and subsistence fish for, per for, for herring. Um, I kind of have selfish regions as a, as a research biologist for this. I kind of want to know the full use of, of subsistence herring out there. It's, it's hard to get an idea of how many people are uh, using herring for subsistence and what their total harvest is. So um, if you subsistence fish for herring, please stop by the office and uh, pick one of these up next year. So there's a little bit of a delay here. I have another slide there. Then. So just a quick, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit, but uh, the primary goal that I had tonight was just to describe our two current herring monitoring uh, programs, which are aerial surveys and age, sex, and size work. Um, but I'm going to start off with just kind of a brief uh, background of the historical fisheries here in the Sound, a uh, little bit of life history that relates to our survey programs, um, and then jump in just to, to explaining our, our current assessment projects. Like I say, you have any comments or questions as we go through, um, go ahead and, and shout them out. So... Taking a look here at the total history of harvest, Prince William Sound, maybe not the total, it was probably some subsistence use or maybe even commercial before, but we don't really have record of it. Uh, starting in the 19-teens to somewhere early 1960s, um, these fisheries were primarily uh, you know, for products like pickled herring and, and canned herring, and then reduction fisheries kind of in this middle period from the 30s up to the 60s. When you say reduction, you mean for oil? Yeah, for oil, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, this more recent period, this is what I'll be talking about mostly um, for the next few slides. This was primarily uh, sacro, food and bait, and spawn on kelp from uh, the late 60s um, up to the late 90s. Herring management plan, the most recent version of the herring management plan that, that um, guided the commercial harvest of herring most recently. Um, just a couple things I want to point out. Um, there is a minimum um, spawning biomass to go commercial fishing. That is 22,000 tons. We're quite a ways below that currently. Um, and we had a max harvest rate of 20% of, of that spawning biomass during those commercial fisheries. Just a little breakdown guideline harvest allocation. You can see the sacro was the biggest fishery um, in this recent period, followed by uh, food and bait, and then pound spawn on kelp. 
and we'll talk, we'll take a look at some of these here currently. One of the really interesting things, I've only been in this office since 2015, I've been the area research biologist since Mr. Moffat retired um, two years ago. One of the interesting things that's always been cool for me is we have a lot of historical information in our office and there's a lot of just real fascinating photos that come up and so I just wanted to share a few here. I think Steve you took these photos. This is of the uh, probably one of the last first seen fisheries I'm thinking or do you remember where no, that was? No, this was in 1992. Oh okay, so not even close. Yep, yeah. and we're in full close. swing. Oh that's yeah. close. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a very robust fishery, lots of black smoke. So is that up by like Zykoff then? At the Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains. On Montague. Uh, take a look at gillnet fisheries, a couple pictures, <laughs> slug. I don't know if this is food and bait, I assume this is sacro as well. <laughs> Picture of the herring pounds. Um, this is fairly popular when we're talking pounds, we're talking these structures here, little frames enclosed with netting, um, run some strings across it, hang kelp leads off it, saying a bunch of herring, dump them in the pound, hope they spawn, and cover your, your, your kelp leads there. Um, I heard today this is Harry Curran. I don't know if you've ever met him. Pretty interesting. Uh, there was also a wild um, spawn on kelp fishery. If you haven't seen herring eggs, they're very small and very sticky. So here's just zooming into this most recent period of harvest here. There's a couple things I want to point out. Like I said, primarily the, the biggest harvests were from the first name sack row. Uh, a couple big events here, 1989, obviously the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, season was closed after that. Uh, we fished for a few more years. There was a population crash somewhere around 1993. Um, so we took 94 through 96 off and then fished 97, 98, and just not, not really even in the, in, the, in the spring of 99 for food and bait. Um, so that's the brief history of the fisheries I wanted to, to show you, but most of you guys looking around uh, the audience here probably know all that and may even have firsthand experience in those fisheries. So now I want to kind of uh, start to move towards towards our, our programs. But first I just want to mention a couple things uh, about herring life history that uh, ap apply to our assessment programs. Um, first of all, uh, Pacific herring, they, they form large pre-spawning aggregations in late, late winter and early spring, kind of near, near shore, near their spawning beaches. And then uh, somewhere in March and early May, they hit the beach and have these large spawning events. Um, the, the spawn is, is super visible from an airplane, you know, big white patches, pretty obvious. That's one reason we use these spawning events as an index of abundance for herring. Um, herring spawn once per year, I should put per year there. And so you can be reasonably certain that if you see, say, a spawning event today, you come back in two days and there's still active milk, those are different fish. Um, we'll talk about mild days of milk and how we add that up here in a second. As far as um, recruiting into the spawning population, or you could also say that becoming sexually mature, um, this usually starts when herring are about three, some three-year-old herring uh, recruit into the spawning population. Most of four-year-olds and, and all of them do by five. Um, in addition to that, these things, everything eats them, you know. And so, in fact, one, one clue as we're doing our aerial surveys to where spawn might pop up is we usually see large aggregations of predators beforehand. And I'll talk about some of those observations here. <coughs> I want to make a brief note about funding because uh, this project has changed funding fairly recently. Um, for a long time, our aerial surveys and ASL work uh, had dedicated funding from the state general fund, uh, meaning it was funded by Fish and Game. Um, when I first got here in 2015, uh, we lost that funding for these assessment programs, along with several salmon programs in the Cordova office, and also um, some permanent staff. So uh, the budget crunch in 2015 had, had real implications for, for this office. 
So luckily we got picked up by Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council um, for funding. And um, that's 17 through 21. Hopefully we're about right in the middle of that. Hopefully we have three more years of funding um, coming there. And we're just one component in a much larger um, hearing research and, mod and, and monitoring program that um, that's our model of this module um, that EVOS is funding currently. Our survey work, the aerial surveys and the ASL work um, are kind of a, a, a bit of a foundation to this program. We provide a lot of samples to other proje projects within uh, the HRM and we also provide data to a lot of other projects in the HRM. So um, the age composition information, size composition, uh, uh, spawning abundance, um, a lot of other programs within the HRM. Use this. So let's move into aerial surveys here. This is a pretty messy map, but for some reason I like it and re I've reused it a couple times. Uh, the red is this year's surveys, 2018. Uh, the black is the last 10 years of surveys, just to get an idea of, of where we're surveying. Um, pretty well, you know, pretty much up the east side of Prince William Sound, a little bit along the northern Nide Island, northern uh, Montague Island. That's Ascension Brook, that's generally the, um, the routes. We do these uh, March through April uh, out of fixed wing aircraft. Uh, usually this Cordova Air is uh, Cessna uh, flying about uh, 1,200 feet off the ground. Uh, in contrast to our salmon aerial survey programs, uh, we have two observers actually for this. We have a primary and a secondary observer. Um, our salmon uh, aerial survey programs are just a, a single guy in the back seat of a tandem tandem cub. Um, it works to have two observers with this. Essentially, you have a primary observer in the back seat uh, digitizing all the observations, and you have a secondary observer up front kind of letting them know what's coming, taking pictures, and it, it seems to work pretty well this way. We average about 15 surveys a year uh, for about 34 flight hours every year. This is the basic aerial survey kit. Um, we try to make all our observations on the tablet in ArcPad so that they're instantly digitized so we don't have to go from you know paper sheets, digitize that, so we just kind of skip that step and use a pad. Um, we also use a couple different GPSs just to uh, mark our tracks, a little bit of redundancy there. This Bluetooth GPS, um, we've used, tried to pair with the camera, but currently we're using a camera, actually, borrowing a camera from, from uh, Scott here that we need to, need to get a new one, but essentially they're GPS linked and that's really, that's really helpful for when we wanna go back and maybe post-process some imagery. Having a video of the entire survey is super helpful to watch it again and make sure you're getting the, um, the spawn extents right and, and that kind of stuff. We also use uh, the site tube, this thing. I'll talk about estimating biomass off of herring schools a little bit but uh, pretty, pretty basic set of tools, really, aside from the tablet and the arc pad. Show you what, kind of what this looks like here. So this is uh, from this year, 2017. This is the spawn event over by Redhead. I think that's the Serenity up there with Marianne doing tagging work in the photo. Uh, but just wanted to show you what kind of the output of this looks. These scribbles here are uh, this milt extent here. Like I say, we do get in there and post-process it and clean it up with the imagery. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to po point this out, a along with these uh, spawn extents, you can also see other observations. Humpback whale here, humpback whale here, 20, 40, 15 sea lions, uh, medium schools of herring, small schools of herring. Um, so the observers are making a lot of, uh, a lot of observations on these trips. We categorize this milt into five categories, essentially. Um, light, medium, and active milt. And then we also have categories for drift and dissipating. Um, we only include the active milt estimates in our overall index. This is that same event we were just looking at. This is the solstice and the serenity down here. And just wanted to point out, like, you know, all this kind of stuff, and probably really starting here. This is just drift. This year, there was so little spawning that we were able to ground truth all of it, actually go and look at where the egg deposition started and ended. And uh, yeah, it was about right here. So 
this, none of this would be included in it. I mean, I guess this is that same event. It was a two-day event. This is the next day. I just wanted to give you another example of what we would call drift. This is all kind of deep water out here. You wouldn't expect this to be active mill. It is drifting from where they're spawning. So this wouldn't be included in our indrift either. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the, the aerial mill surveys, mild days of mill. We also do um, observations of herring schools and try to estimate biomass um, from those observations. We use this site tube. Essentially, if you, if you know your altitude and you have a site tube, you can estimate the surface area of that school. Um, here's another photo of that. Kind of line the school up within this site tube thing. Know your altitude. You can look at it and see what the surface area is. And we have a conversion down here. Uh, this conversion is based on some paired uh, aerial survey and then SANE work. You know, they estimated the the school and then captured it with the SANE. I, there's very few of those though. I think it might be two, two of those. Uh, so this is pretty coarse. But essentially what, what I want to show you is that we do have a rough estimate of, we can estimate biomass from the surface area of those schools. Looks like there's some circa 1916 uh, oh yeah. technology. Oh right yeah, there. no, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sweet. For sure. So in addition to, um, in addition to these uh, herring observations, we also make note of, of other things like we saw on the map there. We, we uh, locate and, and um, enumerate whales sea lions and seals, other sea mammals, or, um, and, and birds here. Um, one note on birds, a lot of interest from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in doing sea duck, uh, scoter captures in the springtime, so all the observers are trying to get up to speed on how to identify bird, bird species so that we can make these surveys uh, even a little more useful. I'm going to show you just the output of a whole survey here, just a quick, simple map. Um, after every survey, we generate one of these and send it around to all other um, folks in the Herring uh, Research and Monitoring Program so they have an idea of what our most recent observations are. A lot of time, these aerial surveys are used to direct the on-the-ground uh, Herring Capture ASL program, and so there's a lot of coordination between Let's dive into some results. So the blue here is, uh, is just where we've observed spawning over the last 11 years, 2008 to 2018. Um, you can see uh, Montague Green, Night Island here, up into Port Fidalgo. One note here is that we do survey Kayak Island, but it's never been included in our mild days of milt index, but m recently there are Let's compare this, what we've seen over the last 10 years to what we've seen the last two years. Um, this is 17. So in 17 was the, I think the first time we failed to detect any spawn on Montague Island. Um, pretty much just seeing it at Canoe Pass in Redhead. 18 was the same story, but um, even a little bit less. Uh, but did see a significant amount down here at, at Kayak. Dive into that a little bit more. This is just looking at the details of 17 and 18. And one thing that you'll see is the locations are pretty similar between the last two years. They're very restricted. Port Provena and Hawkins Island here. But in 17, there were multi-day events at, at, at each spot and um, kind of pop up and, and go. And there was herring spawn in a few different places in Knowles Bay here and onto Cedar Bay and that kind of stuff. This year, it was essentially two-day events, small events at each spot. So, um, yeah, this is the the lowest mile days of milk we've ever seen in the historical time series here. I think a lot of us last year we had about nine and a half mile days of milk. We're thinking eh, it can't get any lower than this, and um, we ended up at about four point five this year. So that's a quick overview of our aerial survey program. I did leave a vital slide out of there somehow. Maybe it'll pop up here in ASL. Um, so let's talk about age, sex, and length. That's ASL. 
Um, I prefer age, sex, and size. It's a little more descriptive of the work that we're doing, but um, that acronym is kind of frowned upon in state publications, so we use <laughs> ASL. But in this work, we, uh, we get age, sex, length, weight, uh, gonad index, which is essentially looking at the gonads and classifying them from totally immature to spent. We get an idea of, of where they are in the maturity. We weigh gonads to get an idea of fecundity. Uh, each of these samples is about 500 um, for an annual total of about two to 4,000 fish that we're working on uh, every year. Do standard length, just wanted to show this. We, we take scales for age. Um, these are just the preferred locations for, for scale collection. Um, this is quite a bit different than salmon. Salmon are right along this diagonal, a couple above the lateral lines. So whereas with herring, you want to take these right behind the opercula. This is what a scale looks like. Um, that's how we age them. The darker areas are summer growth. The lighter areas are when they stop growing in the winter. We call these lighter areas annuli, and that's one year old. So any guesses what this herring is? We have a man that I know has spent some time in the dark room. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's what I would say, yeah. So we capture these fish essentially two different ways and, and kind of in, in two different spots in their life history. Um, we target active spawning events. We get up there close to shore out of skiffs or rafts, and we use a cast net or a big, small variable mesh gill net to capture them. Um, this is Rachel Ertz, our, our ASL biologist that started this spring. Um, and one funny thing that I noticed as I went through oh, looking for photos for this is that it must be a goal of every year's ASL crew to get a sweet cast net shot <laughs> <laughs> because there's quite a few of them for sure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> I mean, really, they just they just keep coming. Yeah, what you don't see is this will go. Yeah. Dozens, dozens no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a final one. Right, yeah. wow. This one's probably the most representative. You can really kind of see the mill here. Mm -hmm. You know, you're really just tossing this into the, a cloud. You can kind of see the fish as they they get up close, but you're not really targeting school. You kind of I think they're over there, and you're chucking them and they can't see you really good either because there's a milk so it kind of works out for both of them. And then you can see the solstice there as the docks in the background. This is probably helpful. A lot of rocks to drag that net across. Oh yeah, we rip those cast nets up every day for sure. Yeah, definitely. So uh, that's the first way we, we, we sample herring. Um, the second way is quite a bit more industrial. Um, we use an uh, anchovy research seine, 150 fathom by 17 fathom. It's a beast of the same. Um, very tight mesh so that it's not size selective, definitely scoops up everything that you, you get in it. Um, apparently it's been an issue to get out on some springs, but I have not had that issue since I've been here. <laughs> uh, just show you a quick photo of what this looks like. We do this work at nighttime. Sets are usually between 1 to 3 a.m., so it's middle of the night. Sleep deprivation is a problem on these because oftentimes you're doing acoustic surveys during the day and then doing this work during the night. So what uh, decent herring school looks on the uh, onboard sonar on the solstice, you can see a decent school there and then a picture of just some smaller schools. We do this work at night because in general, herring come to the surface at night and they're a little more susceptible to capture um, once they're up there. This is a picture, uh, I'm on the solstice. Um, this is a picture of Cedar Bay this year. This is Kenny's boat, the Serenity with Mary Ann's tagging program on. You can see the holding tanks for the herring. They're jigging herring and getting them and, and tagging them. You can just kind of see some of that from this photo. They uh, took a couple bits of this for, for samples. In general, we're getting this purse stain, we're kind of pulling the purse stain in, getting the fish all schooled up, and then dipping them out with the long handle dip net. We're not actually pulling these fish out of the water, we're keeping them in the water. And in fact, in this picture, you can see the corks down and we're spilling them over. And so we're in the process of releasing them. And we probably hold fish for, it's probably about 30 minutes that the fish are, are, are wrapped up. 
I've had a decent amount of um, folks come in or call um, with concerns about this sampling method, um, uh, with concerns for a decline, this declining population. We're sampling with it with a, a, a rather large piece of gear, and so folks are wondering about additive mortality um, with this type of sampling. So, done a quick couple quick back of the napkin calculations here. There's a couple different ways we can estimate biomass. I put a few of them up here. Um, 2018 ASA model, age structured model, um, estimates about 9,400 tons. We can look at uh, Sensor and Sound Science Center Pete Rand's acoustic estimate from this year, about 3,600 tons. We can also take our mild days of milt and use a conversion that Mark Willette came up with in the uh, late 1980s that, that relates mild days of milt to biomass. Um, pretty coarse, but we come up with a, a pretty small biomass there. And so looking at the total estimate uh, of what we captured in the first stain, I'm guessing probably about 40 tons this year. The bulk of that was in the set that you just saw. Um, so what would be a worst case scenario? Uh, we don't have, there's really no information about catch and release staining mortality. So, you know, that might surprise you, but <laughs> not really done that often, you know. Um, given how we do the captures, we don't pull the fish out of the water. I think this is totally overboard, but I'm trying to present a worst case scenario here. Um, there are some issues with holding fish tight together with disease transmission. You know, you hold these things uh, tight together, they can pass diseases between uh, organisms a lot better than if they're just in a naturally kind of space school. So anyway, where I'm going with it is if you take a worst case scenario, it looks like about, you know, 2.4% of the entire spawning biomass if all, you know, if our entire stain captures uh, all died. I've definitely run this up the chain and talked to a number of folks, and I think the department's perspective is that is an acceptable level of additive mortality, um, and particularly given that, that it's a, a worst case scenario. Um, there's a couple things I want to say about it. I mean, nobody wants, I think up until this year, this was less than 1% for sure. This was the first year we've ever got uh, up into this level. Um, the value of this information, the age structure and size structure information is really a driver in understanding the population. Um, nobody likes to kill fish unneeded but I think the value of the information we're getting out of this is, is really helping us understand. In addition to that, um, a, lot of, a lot of the information we get out of these same captures feeds into other programs. So for instance, like the acoustic biomass estimate, you need to have side structure information to, to, to work that estimate up. And so a lot of the other programs are somewhat dependent on, on these captures. So, I'll kind of leave it at that. Last thing I want to say is, I don't think there's a lot of risk here. How we run these surveys is generally we're going out with the solstice, we're doing broad area acoustic surveys to get an idea of what biomass is in the area. And I think if we went out there and looked around early season and, and saw nothing or very few small schools, you know, it's probably time for a conversation between, um, you know, the PIs in, in the Herring Research and Monitoring Program. I don't think that if the other PIs in, in this program were not on board with us doing the sampling that we would continue it. It's 100% funded by EVO's trustee council at this point. So, um, you know, I'm open to chat about it, but I think at this point the department feels this is well within an acceptable level of, of mortality. Um, so moving on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. One point about those estimates is those are just uh, princely and sound proper. Those don't include anything that's kayak fish. Right, those are not including any any kayak fish, yeah. And which one are you using for your biomass? Are you using that? I'm using this one. I'm yeah. using the lowest yeah. possible biomass how, estimate. How did they come up with that number? This number? Uh, so that is essentially our mild days of, uh, of milt. There's a publication. So like in Sitka, right, they, they do a spawn deposition, That's, right? what, that's what it's based on, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, like in, in Sitka, they average about 1,500 tons per mile day, right? Mm -hmm. 
I know. That's I what he did. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you had four and a half mile days, but it's not. Well, I've seen spawn break that up by <coughs> by area. So yeah. some of them are down like 350 tenths per mile. Yeah, there's a wide range. They have it. They have an estimate for each of the yeah. hearing well, districts. What my point was going to be is that often that I've seen that spawn from the air up there, and it's pretty good spawn. Like in Sitka, we were worried about our biomass too, but they did the spawn deposition, and it, it actually they increased our core because the spawn was real section. Yeah, this is this is, you know this low estimate is probably um, the biggest swag, the biggest kind of wild guess for using this weird conversion. I would say these are. Yeah, I just wanted to present a worst case scenario. I've yeah. had a lot of people come with concerns. Yeah. So since I've been doing Sitka, I've been flying here, and I've seen some of the spawn seems light, but some of it seems pretty dense. It was more of that northern spawn. Sure. It seems way better than like if this was going to use some a lot of that Montague spawn, which from what I've seen is way thinner. It might be a little bit of a skewed light. Sure. No, it's a rough way to do it. I mean, yeah. do it using this conversion is, yeah. yeah, it's just the, it's the lowest number I could produce. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at um, some results of this. Hey, we'll start with age composition. This is uh, age composition by deer type over the last two years. 17, uh, sorry, this gray is not totally discernible, but um, all samples dominated by three-year-olds in 2017. Very young population structure. Moving to 2018, all these three-year-olds, some of them turned into four-year-olds, so uh, mostly dominated by four-year-olds um, in 2018. They're also kind of a cycle where it's like every four years they have a boom, right? Yeah, it's, yeah I wish. <laughs> no, that's really discounted then, that's not true. I had it happened like three or four years in a row, and yeah. then it hasn't happened. In it a hasn't happened time. recently. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 80, 84, 88, definitely, but since then, right. so much. Yeah. Um, so I guess the take home message is very few old, old fish you know, in this population. It's, it's dominated by, by very young fish. There's another way to look at this. You can use these bubble charts. Each vertical column here is a year. So we'll just look at 17. You can see, you know, mostly three-year-olds, some four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. And what this helps you do is see uh, really strong year classes as they work their way up through the population. Um, we do have one starting, three, four. I don't want to get too optimistic here. <laughs> it's a small fish in a really small pond is what that is. It's not a big fish in a big pond like 87. Right, and this isn't population level. That's an important thing. I think that what Scott's getting at is this is just proportions. This has nothing to do with total biomass here. So, Okay, let's move on to looking at some size information. I didn't present very much size information, but I, I wanted to look at the weight over length. This gives you a good idea of fish body condition, essentially how, how skinny are they. You get a, how many grams per millimeter of length. This, I just threw all same captured fish uh, from 80 to 2018 that were captured in March and April and looked at it uh, totally separate from age information just to see what we see. And we see a little bit of a downward slope, but I think that's driven. Um, that is, that's not necessarily size, that's more the population is getting younger. If you look at this in the context of ages, there's a couple interesting, notable things. Um, you can see this kind of low point here is in 93. That's during the initial large population collapse. Um, most ages were in very poor body condition, poor nutrition. Uh, follow that up to more recently, and we see 2017, last year, was a historical low for some of these age classes. Um, Five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Really poor condition last year. And looking what we saw with that kind of fits with what we saw for spawn observations in 2018 um, as well. So let's move on, and I think I'm going to wrap it up with this one. Um, this is sex ratios. 
So there's been some interesting observations over the years of, of collecting this stuff. Um, again, this is 17 and 18 sex ratios. And one thing you'll notice is that the gill net, cast net are consistently higher proportion of males um, than, the, than the purse seine. And this is just two years, so it's hard to get that trend. But if you look back across uh, you know, a longer time series, that's generally the case. There's a lot more males um, when, you know, in these gill net and, and cast net captures. That's likely because these are targeting active spawns, not so much the gear type, it's that these are the samples we're getting from the active spawn, mm -hmm. these are the samples we're getting from the purse thing. The schools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there's, I've heard a number of different hypotheses at this point about this. Um, there's a recent publication, Ward et al. came out looking at 83 to 2015, Steve's an author on that paper. Um, but just a, a, a pretty interesting observation. When I first got here, I had a number of conversations about, is this just um, gear selectivity? Is there something about cast nets that they, they somehow select for males? Mm. And so last year we did a number of paired uh, tests. We, we you know, um, sampled the same spawning event with both variable mesh gill nets and cast nets. And no, it, it turns out that, yeah, it seems like there's just a higher proportion of males in, in the spawn there. I'm not going to try to explain that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. that's all I got. Um, so we got one thing. This was a this was a, a photo I saw as I was rolling through and figured it would be a good, good outro here. So there's a lot of folks to think. I mean, this is a pretty big program at this point. Um, lots of different uh, agencies and institutions involved, and uh, in our office and particular fishing game, it seems like everybody pitches in on this program. Uh, it's kind of early spring before a lot of our seasonals come up, and so like last year we had uh, Charlie Russell and, and a number of other folks from the office on the boat, and it, kind of everybody everybody pitches in for it, so it's a, a lot of thanks to those folks. That's all I got. <laughs> I can keep going. Um, I do have a number of <laughs> slides still there, but I figured I'd end it here. Uh, any discussion or questions or anything? Solid, yeah. What do you hear from the people who take the disease samples to Port Townsend area? Yeah, we're still doing that. I mean, that's one of the big uh, um, uses of the solstice. You know, the solstice is kind of a research platform for multiple groups, and the disease is, is one of the primary ones. And uh, um, I haven't heard much recently. The big event last year was that we, um, from these, from our ASL sampling, we got eggs and milt, and we sent that down um, to Marrowstone to the, to the lab there. They successfully spawned those fish in another state and are now running a large matrix experiment on um, oil exposure to, the, to those fish. Or no, not oil exposure, uh, disease trials, yeah. So, I don't really have the latest and greatest. Scott would probably be a better source of, <laughs> of disease summary than I am. Uh, I don't know so if you have anything to The add. biggest thing is that they've shifted from looking at uh, prevalence, which is how many were sick that day, to looking at antibody presence, so they can get a much better idea of what's happened. In 2015, the prevalence of the VHS, which is really lethal, disease that runs through was 30% of the fish had the antibodies and that disease normally kills in cold water 80 to 90% of the fish that contract it. So you can see that you know that was a sign that was really bad. Yeah, here it's the antibodies are typically 8 to 10% of the fish that are sampled sick at or, you know, two to five percent uh, of fish have that antibody. They're redoing a lot of the stuff with a little bit more sensitivity to make sure that uh, they don't have anything else pop up. But it definitely looks a lot worse than sick at and they had a really bad year from 2014 to 15.
last summer Scott was asking fishermen to, if you brought up a little baby herring in your mm -hmm. net, take the pictures and tell us where it was. Sure. Um, so the old, the whole season I didn't see any except for um, the squirrel bag. We got some, and so I sent Scott some pictures. I noticed your flyover. Um, you didn't go to Squirrel Bay with like the double twins or the stuff that's kind of on the outside there. Right. Yeah, we don't usually hit that west coast at all. Um, primarily, we're not surveying for juveniles. So, yeah, well, I mean, like where they spawn, do those fish generally grow up in that same day that they were spawned in, or is that? No, not I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think they're generally pretty separate as juveniles, and then once they recruit into the, the spawning population. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so what's the latest thinking about why they're just not coming back? Like we all thought they would. Yeah, I don't know that there's a, a major uh, consensus really. You know, there's been some review or synthesis papers published. Pearson 2012 looked at a number of different hypotheses and uh, the more recent one here, Ward et al. I think 2017 looked at some stuff. And I think the first thing is separating, like, okay, what was the cause of the collapse? Address that a little bit separately than, than why aren't they recovering? And, you know, again, I don't think there's a major consensus, but it seems like um, the collapse, the likely cause is, is just poor body condition. You know, um, probably large scale uh, marine environment changes that just led herring to, you know, not be as productive and, and have a hard time foraging. You know, you get a fish that's nutritionally stressed, they're likely more susceptible to disease. So a lot of the, you know, what I've heard is kind of this nutri nutritional stress with disease as a secondary factor um, for the collapse. And then as far as the lack of recovery, I think overall it's kind of the same, kind of the same deal to some degree. Conditions just aren't great for the recruitment of, of herring. Um, Ward 2017 identified um, freshwater inputs into the Gulf as, as one of the, you know, kind of the leading, leading causes of, of not recovering. Um, essentially there's, uh, you know, the, the bottom layer of the ocean is getting saltier, the top layer is getting fresher. That seems to be a problem for herring. Um, happy to print you off a copy of that paper if you're interested. I've also seen, you know, there's a number of hypotheses about uh, overwintering humpback whales in Prince William Sound, you know, hitting the spawning biomass pretty hard by staying here and being residents. Uh, and then there's also some hypotheses on, on um, pink salmon juveniles. You know, we have a lot of pink salmon. Um, juvenile pink salmon in the springtime in Prince William Sound, and they likely eat age zero herring, they overlap. Um, so there's probably some predation pressure on age zero, and then there's probably some competition pressure with, with age one. Um, and so those are some of the main ones I've heard. There's no smoking gun, you know, like any big ecological question like this, it's likely a variety of you know, factors coming together at once. But those are the dominant ideas that I've heard. Anybody have more? I guess the comment I was gonna make is that the herring in Southeast on the inside are all struggling too. It's yeah. not just Prince William Sound. It's yeah. the, the ocean herring, the herring that seem to forage on the ocean seems to be doing okay, but all the fish that are foraging inside is... And that inside. fits with what we see here. You know, it seems like Kayak Island is fairly productive. All right, that's about it. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you.